uh, this this presentation. Uh, first of all, it is intended to be a kind of casual crash course uh, presentation with the hope that it will generate some sort of uh, debate at the end or in your uh, mind somehow. Uh, and I somehow ch chose the title as this, a postmodern reversal, a capitalist interiorization of urbanity. Uh, here we will talk about how postmodern the issue is uh, and also how uh, the urbanity is interiorized in this context and how it is a capitalist uh, process. So I will relate, I will try to relate those three issues uh, to each other. And I will start with the uh, idea of uh, interior urbanism. Uh, that's the term or uh, the area uh, some scholars concentrated on, like uh, Charles Rice. And uh, it's called interior urbanism. And also there are uh, different interpretations of it, like uh, interior urbanity or urban interiority. Uh, some academics like Susie Atwell uh, is also writing about this and some other scholars. So uh, this, this point, this topic, uh, simply, I will try to simplify it as an urban space being internalized uh, in a sort of building uh, by way of simulating it inside an uh, interior space. So, uh, and I will try to relate this issue to our context at the end. Of course, when an urban, when an urban space is interiorized, let's say, uh, you put a security guard uh, at the gate of it, and somehow it's, uh, it, it infiltrates, uh, controls the access to this public, so-called public space. And only a certain uh, section of the society are kind of allowed in this space. And uh, that's why we will discuss the uh, capitalist nature of this kind of transformation, let's say. Uh, and it becomes a private property, uh, obviously. So urban space become uh, privatized uh, in, a, in a building, in a box. Um, so whose brilliant idea was that? I mean, who, who, who invented that? Uh, the literature refers to uh, a wonderful genius guy, and, a wonderful architect called John Portman. And his, uh, let's say, invention of the atrium, which we are very familiar with. Uh, and these are uh, his kind of typical uh, and well-known uh, examples, where he kind of simulates the urban attributes, urban values, virtues, let's say, within a building, a large space, uh, as you can see here. And this idea was uh, kind of welcomed and met, met with uh, great uh, praise and uh, happiness and joy uh, by certain uh, segments of the society. Uh, that uh, Portman started to do many versions of this uh, invention, let's say, space uh, typology. As you can see, many atriums in hotels, uh, shopping malls, etc. Uh, but the point is, uh, although the in interior, the volume, kind of simulated the uh, urban environment, the buildings themselves were objects within the urban space. If you remember the previous discussions about the figure ground reversal, uh, these were the objects, these were the figures uh, in the free 
uh, urban space in the contemporary uh, city. So uh, in this way, uh, urban space was kind of reversed, like the city itself. Uh, and he was so happy with his achievement that uh, it kind of leads, uh, it did lead to uh, examples like this great Venetian hotel or something uh, where the whole Venice is simulated within a hotel building in a shopping uh, uh, story, shopping level of that building. Obviously, that building is in Las Vegas. And that <laughs> quickly reminds us the um, Venturi's learning from Las Vegas in 1970. So uh, the postmodernity comes into the stage with that kind of association as well. In this way, the real Venice was kind of simulated in an interior space. Uh, we, can, we can ask why was that? Was it only the, uh, was the reason only the money? Uh, obviously that was one thing, but the main thing was control. I will discuss what the control is uh, because the real urban space is uh, an uncontrolled space, unco uncontrollable space, let's say. And uh, that was a problem. Uh, we can say uh, there is a discomfort, uneasiness with public open space because it's uncontrolled. Uh, we can see from this lady's face that she's not very happy with the public, but urban space uh, are actually the uh, containers or the molds that shapes the life, public life. So we have to look at the urban space in that way. Uh, that's where the life and the social relationships occur or emerge. And uh, in that emergence, people demand things together. Uh, they demand uh, many things, many rights. Uh, later, we will see that these demand was also uh, reversed, which I will explain in a minute. So uh, the purpose for that problem was controlling urbanity, because urbanity is uncontrollable. Let's control it, capital says. <laughs> uh, first of all, you have to silence them because they are too loud. Uh, the best way to silence them is a uh, spatial intervention. Uh, how do you do it? You put people into a controlled box, a cage. So that's how you internalize the urban space and the urbanity itself. Now, uh, with the security uh, at the gate, you uh, filtrate, eliminate certain people, and especially sur survey. Uh, you put everybody under surveillance that you watch them. Uh, and in that way, you control them. Uh, in that public property, everything is uh, observed, uh, monitored, uh, recorded. Uh, so the problem of uh, uneasiness with the uh, public space or the publicness, the solution uh, they, the capital developed was kind of a multi-dimensional mechanism. Uh, I, I am trying to categorize them under four uh, subtitles. One is a deliberate destruction of the specialization of collective urbanity. Uh, they wanted to destroy that collectivity. Uh, the second mechanism, I think they created a kind of uh, rupture in the perception of space uh, in terms of interior exterior split. And uh, I believe these were parallel with the uh, three main conflicts of the capitalism itself, like uh, 
uh, workers and the bourgeois, uh, labor and capital, and rural and urban. So these was being added as another conflict uh, in the system. Uh, another mechan mechanism was kind of uh, mental intoxication of the collective urban realm. Uh, so they were trying to kind of mentally um, discredit, let's say, the collectiveness. Uh, the last one I might uh, suggest that it, the glorification of interior. What a good thing the interior is. Uh, so that's the final mechanism. Uh, if we go back to the unease of the uh, upper class uh, or the capital itself with public, I mean, we can see from the uh, queen's face that she's not happy at all. Uh, her rest in peace, really, she was that kind of a person. And the successor, Prince, and now, sorry, the King Charles uh, appears to be not very different either. Uh, so, from the very early ages of history, uh, there were attempts to uh, tackle uh, with public rage. And from, and it started the well known uh, precedent of this is the gladiator fights. And today we are continuing with the football games. Uh, and in terms of its uh, space, uh, it started from arena and now uh, developed into stadium. So these were the spaces where the leaders uh, of that society, uh, the rulers of the society, were kind of watching their uh, public, controlling them uh, with not very happy faces, as you can see. And they were kind of deciding who's gonna uh, live and who's not. Uh, so these were the controlled spaces of spectacles, which kind of uh, take the pressure, uh, public pressure, public demands, take this pressure, absorb it uh, in these events and their uh, spatial framework. Um, and it continues today, actually. Uh, recently, Argentina won the World Cup in Qatar, so everybody was busy with that, and kind of we sweared a lot and you know shouted a lot and kind of released that pressure. Uh, so it still works. Uh, and those arenas later in Middle Ages turned into urban uh, squares, urban plazas, uh, which again gathered people and kind of uh, raise their voice uh, for various demands. Uh, as you can see, there are uh, transformations. And in our case, if you can see my cursor, the transformation, uh, which we saw in the previous slide, in our case, it turned into this, from a stadium to a private uh, residence. That's how publicness and privateness uh, emerges in different contexts. Uh, and uh, watching the public space, the public and its space uh, has a background and Eamon Kenneth is kind of discussing the history of it and going back to the Middle Ages and even the Renaissance uh, by using the technology of the time, let's say, uh, the single vanishing point perspective, uh, how urban spaces are organized uh, around the gaze of the ruler. Uh, so he's claiming that there is kind of mild control of uh, society uh, by the feudal rulers of, of that time. Uh, all this enclosure uh, perspective, etc., was kind of mildly controlling, at least watching, uh, the public, the society, the people. Uh, then, uh, in another book, he again uh, 
relates this issue with the ethic, especially its transformation in the modern ages, uh, with the examples that you uh, see before in the previous uh, presentations, how ethics are kind of transformed uh, in relation uh, the urban context uh, is transformed as well. But overall, at least until now, let's say, uh, there is a kind of fine balance between uh, public freedom and public control. And uh, Eamon Kenneth's claim that uh, Middle Age, uh, in the urban space in the Middle Ages was kind of achieving this balance, at least trying to do it. Uh, but overall, urban space is uh, an uncontrollable mass gathering space. Uh, let's uh, quickly go through the uh, precedents or the roots of uh, urban space or uh, square. I mean, from Göbekli Tepe to Stonehenge, uh, these gathering uh, spaces uh, from Hellenistic Agora to uh, Roman Forum uh, or the medieval uh, urban squares. These are all the roots of uh, current urban space. But the main point is the bodiliness, bodily involvement in space, uh, the issue of spectacle and rituality of this uh, space. So. Uh, this is somehow um, exploited in a way, as we will see in a minute. But uh, in terms of uh, politics, uh, politics as I'm not uh, talking about an ideological issue here, although it is ideological, politics means the way of society uh, operates. So. Uh, urban square, uh, in that sense, is is the heart of an organism, organism of the society, uh, and all the, all the uh, spatial uh, components of the city are kind of uh, flooding into the heart of the city through its streets, like the veins in a body. Uh, and we all know that all these uh, well-known urban squares are uh, examples of that kind of function, uh, the heart of the city, the core of the city. Uh, from Tra Trafalgar, I mean, which witnessed uh, many, many events, uh, to Tahrir Square and also Taksim Square, you know. Uh, the, and we are coming to the term uh, Meydan in Turkish, and it comes from Arabic, actually. Uh, These letters M, D, and N with the different combinations, and also refers to the Medina, the city. Uh, so Meydan is uh, how we uh, define it in our language. But Meydan, when, when we say Meydan, uh, recently, I kind of remember Meydan shopping center and uh, or plus whatever we call it Maidan. everybody is going to Maidan. my friends are inviting me to Maidan. Uh, we are eating there uh, leaving there it is supposed to be a Maidan by its name but uh, if you look at it i mean if you compare this Maidan, the <laughs> common space in between the blocks uh, it doesn't exactly uh, show the characteristics of the former examples uh, of well-known uh, plazas. Especially this water element, the landscape elements are so, uh, let's say, calm and dignifying that uh, Dr. Spencer discusses this uh, contemporary architecture, contemporary urban landscape, and compares them to the 19th century landscape painting. And he claims somehow uh, that uh, in the 19th century where the industrial revolution was occurring, I mean, uh, labor classes are kind of uh, in turmoil, etc. And 
at that time, pa painters, landscape painters, was depicting the landscape for some reason in such a dignified and calm way that as if nothing happens in the society. And there are some people, one or two people happily standing, lying very quietly in the landscape. So he claims that was a deliberate uh, attempt to disguise the turmoil uh, going on on the Industrial Revolution. And he compares the current uh, landscape arrangements, especially the water elements, as a pacifying uh, tactic, urban tactic, uh, in the recent uh, decades. Uh, so moving from here, we can now look at the capital's counter tactics to uh, deal with the publicness. Uh, of urban squares. Uh, we, we discussed about the mechanisms. Now I'm going to talk about a uh, few tactics. One is a transformation, uh, the transformation, the dislocation, and pacification via greening. Taksim Square is a good example of uh, these tactics. You see, it is transformed after uh, 2013 events, especially with the demolition of uh, Atatürk Cultural Center, the mosque, etc., the closing of the square to the events, etc. I mean, it is transformed. Another thing is the dislocation. As you know, all the uh, public events are kind of uh, prohibited from uh, Taksim Square, and these two infill areas, Maltepe uh, and Yenikapı areas are built by filling the sea. Uh, and people are kindly requested to make their demonstrations in these two spaces, not in Taksim. Uh, so this, this means urbanity is dislocated. How we can uh, interpret later. And also uh, pacification. Uh, some call this as a false uh, antidote, which I will explain in a minute. Uh, and toxin uh, competition was again a good example of that. I mean, everybody, all the architects were kind of, although there were many events and the collective memory there, everybody was treating Taksim Square as a park. Uh, so this was a good example, uh, again, uh, reminding us uh, Spencer's play. So I will, huh, another thing, another thing is that uh, through this, these tactics, an urban panopticon was kind of created. You know what panopticon is. Uh, it's a kind of uh, prison type with a central control tower in it, watching everybody. And especially after the uh, symbol, the symbol of capitalism, Twin Towers, it's in Manhattan, uh, in Wall Street, where the finance is, uh, et cetera. Uh, so after its demolition in 9-11, uh, the whole urban context was converted into a, a panopticon a prison that everybody is watching us at every moment. And they are watching us in a center on a screen. So that's urban space now. Uh, and there were uh, kind of precedents of this idea of covering, that's Fuller's, I think, uh, covering a wide area of city. And com this, is, this is Panopticon, as you can see, converting it into a controlled space. They say in terms of climate, but that's not uh, it. Uh, so in that way, people are public is somehow caged, controlled uh, by by what interiorization of uh, urban space, which we live in it in all uh, shopping malls, AVMs, you know. 
so it is it is achieved it is accomplished that urban interior uh, uh, is created and urban spaces uh, simulated and interiorized Th that's how a pseudo urbanity a false urbanity is uh, produced uh, in that sense, urbanity is reversed uh, from exterior uncontrollable uh, urbanity to interior and controlled urbanity. So another uh, conflict has played a major role in that. We discussed about the three conflicts uh, and I added the interior exterior split as another conflict. Now another one, fourth or fifth, you can say, uh, the production and consumption conflict. Of course, when there is a production, there is a consumption too. But the uh, after industrial revolution uh, with uh, capitalism, uh, the consumption gained the uh, main importance of the whole system. Uh, and as you know, again, we are going to the postmodernity issue. Postmodernity is associated with consumption. Uh, so it became an instrument of mass control. You make them consume so that you can control them uh, with the commercials, etc. We can you know all about this. So we consume and consume and consume. So we, we become the slaves uh, of uh, the system in a way. But you need a stage for that. You need a kind of a new space for that. And these interior urban, uh, so-called urban spaces are the new temples of this consumption. So that interiorization has you know, uh, combined many uh, intentions of the uh, system and uh, it became an interior, interiorized, uh, reversed, urban space. So there are two supplement strategies in all these mechanisms. One is uh, abandoning an urban void, like Batican, uh, or overloading it. There are two ways which are presented as a choice to the designers, to the planners, to the architects. So architects are kind of confronted with a trap whether to fill it or leave it. We are in a similar situation in, in that. And that occurs in such a climate that uh, the winds, the four winds, I call it, uh, the winds are affecting this process. One is the formation of uh, conceptual existing conceptual frameworks. I mean, all these ideas about how society works has kind of blurred with the information pollution. But the reality is that. The second is the image, image worshiping, image consumption. Uh, that is again promoted as another wind blowing around us. Uh, the third one was demonizing uh, the political awareness. Everybody avoids being, I'm not political, I'm apolitical, and because it is uh, implanted in our minds that you shouldn't be political. Uh, and especially you shouldn't be enrolled at all. Uh, and the fourth wind, which we are living today, is techno-mediatic uh, addiction. We are always in these machines, Instagram, blah, blah. So we kind of uh, addicted to the technology. So these four winds are creating a climate. Uh, and these cli this climate is interacting with the mechanisms that I and the tactics that I showed you, which results in uh, this reversal. The outcome is the reversal. Uh, so we, we kind of create a postmodern uh, urbanity where we consume and et cetera. So let's come back to this uh, trap of duality that is presented to the designers for urban space. When you see an urban space, uh, a terrain bug, let's say, you have 
uh, two options or two situations. Uh, one, uh, it is left abandoned for so many years, like Vatican, or it is filled up. It is commodified, uh, but uh, being abandoned is a potential for future demand for maximized exploitation. It is left there so that I, I will explain how it uh, works. Yes, these are the two uh, extreme examples that we kind of uh, deal with in our design task in our studio. Uh, these two mechanisms occur uh, with this uh, rationale. If it is uh, left abandoned, it decays. It devalues, loss, loses its value. If it's filled up, then it is overloaded, overpriced, because you know you have to finance uh, the investment there. But in, in the first case, when when it is decayed, then mentally you are sacrificing it, you are forgetting, dis discarding it. Uh, but at the same time, there is an opportunity arises uh, for wholesale purchase it is so decayed i mean we have to sell it to someone you know so that he can do something uh, in filling up uh, you create kind of uh, unaffordability because it is overpriced not everybody can access there and uh, somebody has to own it this uh, massive uh, investment has to be owned by someone. So whether it is uh, left abandoned, the process leads us to private appropriation. Or if it is filled up, then we end up with gentrification. So you And all of these although they seem two opposite ends, they end up with uh, a public, uh, private property controlling the urban space. So these two uh, seemingly presented options refer to the same end, leads to the same end. So Terenwag becomes a blank, to be filled in, whether you fill it with building or green, you fill it with money. When it is done, the game's over. Uh, the urban void is transferred from public to private. The mission is uh, accomplished. People are kind of caged. They are paralyzed. Society is pacified. They are entrapped and imprisoned in, in an interior uh, space. And obviously, you, you search for refuge in pseudo kind of comfort, in consumption. But the real urbanity is uh, a, a life free for all, at all times, uh, it's that kind of life. You, you don't have a kind of security guard in front of a plaza, whether you can get in, what, uh, put your wallet, telephone, keys, etc. cetera. You, you can access everywhere. You can do anything there, you know, you can sit, uh, you can lie down, you can uh, casually social, like, socialize, uh, you can rest there, you can uh, isolate yourself within crowds, uh, you can interact or you can take strolls, you can, you can do anything really. You can do exercising uh, within the urban space uh, or you can stay by yourself and uh, contemplate. You can watch the city from different levels, uh, vista points, etc. You can wine and dine, you can go to cafes, uh, you can enjoy the uh, possibilities of leisure. If you're not rich enough, you can, you can have you know, street food and enjoy the city again. 
you can attend for free uh, the street performances. Uh, you can enjoy uh, the social aspect of street shopping. Uh, you can relax uh, or you can uh, be involved in urban adrenaline, crowd, events, actions, etc. Uh, concerts, uh, street art, etc. I mean, everything urban is free to everyone at all times. That's real urbanity. And that urbanity emerges in an urban void, urban void. As you can see here, it is a defined void where all these activities, the real urbanity can emerge. And that urbanity, that emergence, that void uh, is so es essential that it's kind of uh, a reiteration of our uh, existence uh, on earth, uh, in the world, in life. You emerge with a kind of uh, membrane, a shell, uh, and we keep reiterating it in urban space. Uh, but scale is important. It's a shell for me that one is a shell for a community. So scale issue, which we will discuss. Uh, that urbanity is kind of formed, molded uh, in urban space. Like uh, with the clay, you mold bricks, which built the cities eventually. Uh, the public life is molded in urban spaces. Uh, whether, whether it is organic or regular, strict, uh, axial, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, it's a void and it's, it's a kind of mold. Uh, as you can remember from our previous uh, discussions that these are the uh, issues and uh, mechanisms that how this kind of urbanity uh, is achieved through urban means. In this, you see, this is the reversal. Uh, Rove and Coter was uh, uh, talking about. Uh, here in this white area, uh, urbanity emerges. But in these blocks, black blocks, uh, we talk about interior urbanity, as we discussed. So uh, this is Nolly's plan. Uh, and this is the space, urban space. And this is where it is, you see, Pantheon and the urban square in front. It's like a continuation, actually, you know that. And this kind of urbanity and urban design, urban morphology, let's say, can be followed uh, through the line of reading, which I kind of summarized here. I will not go through them, uh, but maybe we can share the presentation later. So all these uh, literature talks about this, these um, urban virtues, uh, let's say. Um, so, but that urbanity is now reversed, like the city itself. And uh, Spencer is talking about this reversal, uh, especially uh, in the 21st century, how it's kind of uh, accelerated. Uh, and he's discussing this landscape, -ish, contemporary landscapes, how they are kind of um, obstructive in a way of public, uh, let's say, um, publicness. These are his books. Now, uh, the greening issue. Some, actually many, claim that capitalism works with a dual mechanism. It creates its uh, toxins and develops its antithesis, antitoxins as well, and presents them as a solution, but both of them work for itself. That's, that's a claim. So here, 
we have a similar situation. Uh, the system contaminates the urban space with buildings. Then suddenly we are presented with a fake antidote, greening the urbanity, which we are living in for several decades. Uh, of course, this, this is done in a very uh, valuable uh, ideas of environmental awareness, ecological consciousness, sustainable uh, living, etc. These are very uh, important issues, but it is kind of exploited. So it seems the system provides that there is a poison and there is an antidote. If you put the antidote, everybody gets well, we suppose. So if they, they present building and they present you with a park, okay, you are fed up with building, there you go. You, you fed up with concrete, you have grass and trees. But is that so? When, especially when, uh, both poison and its antidote is given by the same hand, then we think about it. There must be something wrong here. Acaba kandırılıyor, kandırılıyor muyum? Yeah. Uh, the same hand, and that hand can be Adam Smith's invisible hand, which you might uh, look at that. Uh, in that system, with all these climate of um, sustainability, ecology, climate crisis, institution, they, they kind of form an institutional pressure on the leaders of uh, rulers of uh, cities, spaces, societies, etc. That's pressure, and somehow that pressure also reversed the demands. If you remember, the public was kind of voicing other things about rights, freedom, etc. Now they keep demanding trees. That is achieved. Nobody talks about uh, uh, things that kind of exploits them, but they demand trees. So that, that is a good achievement. Uh, <clears throat> it works that way. That pressure and that demand under these conditions, the ruler kind of presents the antidote. Green, if you want green, okay. Then money floods from these institutions. So there are fundings and etc. Uh, and when he provides this antidote, then people start voting him. Okay, he provided us green. Lovely. So it works perfectly. Again, the uh, Taksim Square is a good example of that. Uh, so the system works by giving both the toxin and the antidote, and it gets richer, and some call this um, greenwashing. So, you know, it launders uh, the dirt with green. Uh, and it is it, be, it becomes a kind of instrument, uh, a class-based instrument for mass public control. That that's a debate. Uh, and as I said, I mean that's uh, that presentation and these uh, arguments are uh, kind of my personal view and personal standpoint, which are open to discussion, objection, opposition, etc. And that's the whole point of. Uh, us being in the university anyway. Uh, so it becomes a mass control instrument. And there is a considerable literature about uh, this issue, how greening uh, refers to kind of uh, controlling uh, people. Uh, and it goes back to the history and kind of traces its roots. Uh, but it, it seems that it create, creates a division, another conflict between upper classes and lower classes, which uh, one is uh, kind of gifted with kind of um, 
urban uh, urban virtues, while the other is given uh, with rural uh, values, rural culture. So uh, a kind of separation is created uh, with that uh, intervention. I mean, all the art, uh, culture, etc., are still in those uh, pseudo-urban areas. And as you can see here, the politicians who provided the green to the public, which are really passively sitting there, and all the bureaucrats are kind of applauding him. Thank you, our mayor, our minister, for giving us the green. Uh, so, uh, another thing happens with this process. Uh, the traces of time are erased. It serves to that too. Uh, as you know, cities are, if you remember uh, Rossi's objection to Siam, etc. Uh, cities are accumulation uh, and stratification of memories, collective memories, political memories, all sorts of memories in the space. Uh, but the urbanity at once and by a single hand, which is probably the invisible hand, uh, urbanity at once uh, creates some sort of uh, schizophrenic uh, context where all the memories are lost or not built at least. Uh, we can see many examples of that uh, in urban recent history. So a kind of pseudo-urbanity, as if city is created. Uh, these are uh, capitalist urban centers, which are you know well known, uh, and they become they dominate the rest of uh, cities. And most of them are out of human scale for some reason. If you remember, the values of urbanity are always associated with scale. So, uh, but the real urban space uh, occurs in time. It accumulates in time. Uh, it gathers uh, memories, uh, events, traces, etc. Uh, so this is this is how the city uh, develops, evolves, actually, not like that in a single moment by someone saying let's do it do it or someone kind of owning it city is not something like that as you can see it's multi-layered so all these uh, mechanis mechanisms and tactics are kind of uh, operating to erase that uh, mechanism uh, the time uh, component in the city however as you can see i mean these are from uh, other countries and this is uh, Kadiköy, Haydar Pasha, uh, Yeni Kapı. You see, these are voids, but you know, uh, accumulated with history uh, from different periods, etc. Now, I'm uh, closing with Batukent. When we discussed about this assignment, this task, uh, this design problem, uh, yes, you have a challenge that. We are asking you to uh, do it at once. But you can propose uh, stagings, etc. But uh, in essence, a studio is giving you a task to finish by a group, not a single person, thankfully, uh, but at once. That's challenge one. And in this topic that we have given you, I believe uh, uh, there are three components. One is Teren Vag. The other is urban core or urbanity. The third one is Batukan. So there are three issues. And the first one addresses the void issue that I discussed. Uh, urbanity talks about the notion of a center. 
and also deals with urban, urbane, let's say, values and virtues. Uh, but the Kant, as we discussed with the cooperatives and uh, uh, with the workers' uh, organizations, etc., it's it's a political uh, settlement. So there are three uh, triple uh, criteria, uh, three components and tri triple criteria to deal with the problem. Void, as I said before, uh, accommodates its paradoxes. Uh, you need to resolve those paradoxes. Uh, so abandoned, filled up, open, built, rural, urban, public, privatized, etc. You have to deal with that. And the reinventing part of the uh, topic of our studio uh, asks for or the requires for architects' attitude, position towards these triple criteria. What is your position? That's why we were asking about your vision, your statement, uh, et cetera. What is your position in that? Uh, this position uh, constitutes the second challenge. Uh, yes, we have a very large void, an extremely large void, uh, but that means it is capable of accommodating many voids inside in urbane and humane scale. Uh, and you see, we have a kind of toxic, let's say, element here with its public prop, uh, private property. Now you have to make a choice, uh, take your position, whether it is public or private. So that's a challenge presented to you. As I said, I mean, this, this void has a capacity to have multiple uh, urban voids, urban spaces in scale. And you are kind of asked to do that. And it presents these, uh, these paradoxes itself, as it is now, but again, it presents a void left over, abandoned, and it presents a part which is filled up extremely. So all these discussions uh, I argued here are there for you uh, to deal with that trap, how you're going to deal with that trap. And that thing has kind of brought us this uh, weird landscape proposal that we have come across at the beginning of the semester. We have this. Uh, cliche Im images of landscape planning of uh, the current uh, trends. Uh, there is another alternative, actually, if you look at it, we didn't discuss this much, but the, a previous one. This, this was uh, previously designed again for our area, uh, kind of park or forest, whatever it is, a huge lake. Uh, and again, it has a model to all these cliche images of a greenery. So, uh, it's a way of filling in the blanks. So it reminds us, uh, my argument, my personal argument about mass public control, but uh, the the original plan of uh, Batikant and its uh, transformation with this proposal, uh, it, we can we can we can see that there is a kind of pressure to convert it into a green area. And as we discussed, especially with uh, Chalatayoja's presentation about uh, mall uh, lobbies <laughs> pressures to. Uh, keep their position, uh, the, these areas has to turn into passive spaces uh, like this. I mean, this pressure has kind of turned into these landscape proposals. Uh, yes, as I said, this is filling in the blank, whether with this building or with this uh, cliches, uh, uh, 
kind of uh, reversal is being achieved and you are asked to take uh, kind of action uh, against that or with that. Uh, so this trap for architects uh, presented the second option, the filling up, as, as we discussed throughout the semester. We have a filled up with all these plazas, towers, etc. very dense uh, intervention into the urban space to interiorize it, basically. Uh, yes, you can see the interiorization of, that's the public space there. That's the urbanity there now. And we are asking you to say something about it, whatever it is. And you see, it is so commercial, it's so capitalist that, especially with these neon lights, you know, we kind of turn into a rabbit with the light put in his eyes. So, uh, you know, uh, you are kind of asked to reinterpret, uh, question uh, the urban roots of uh, Batikant, uh, its intentions, uh, etc. So I think that's all what I'm going to say. As I said, I mean, that's my personal view on this. So, uh, yeah, okay. Shall I stop sharing? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for listening and your patience. Thank you very much. I, I missed, I think, something like uh, yeah. five to seven minutes. <laughs> that's, that's okay. I could, I could follow you, the rest. You, you didn't miss anything, really, Jana. You know. For us, yeah. it was a brilliant uh, lecture. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I hope Thank our students benefit from that. And I'm sorry for those who cannot, who couldn't attend, because this is, I think, the most relevant uh, part of our uh, problem this year. Uh, unless one is aware that, you know, space is political and underlying all this wonderful lecture is that kind of an understanding like this. Uh, if we, we are not aware of it, we become instruments. Hmm? We become useful architects. Useful. Huh? What do we mean by that? <laughs> Araç oluruz. Araç I think, uh, yeah, instrument, instrumentalization Araç. of our uh, professional Araç. skills is a horrible deed indeed. And that's what's happening all throughout the world, actually, mm -hmm. minority. And that's what uh, Murat Hoca is uh, referring as a trap for architects, I guess. Uh, so, uh, an awareness of this trap uh, will be good for humanity and will be good <laughs> for you know, writing your problematic, maybe. I mean, whatever whatever your position is, I mean, uh, as Aydan just said, I mean, you have to be aware of it and you can make choices. Yeah. But you have to be aware, uh, accountable, responsible for, for your position, really. Uh, that's yeah, the thing. I have questions to you. <laughs> I have another question. Uh, first of all, I mean, uh, urbanity is mm -hmm. very related with urban culture. I mean, urban way of life, indeed, urbanity. This is what it means. And uh, finally, there is also, uh, I mean, uh, it was coined uh, in French first by Honoré de Balzac mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. urban manners, indeed. Uh, and then later on, in the in mid 20th century, it is Henri Lefebvre, finally, yeah. uh, who will reappropriate uh, this term urbanity uh, in a more, uh, I mean, uh, leftist manner. Uh, and he will say it is a form of resistance to the discipline imposed by the capitalism, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because the capitalism imposes a certain discipline to, uh, to the citizens. I mean, uh, they become indeed uh, 
kind of, uh, uh, let's say they are uh, enslaved in a way uh, by the conditions of work mm -hmm. imposed mm -hmm. by capitalism and also by, um, you know, um, all these uh, in, in the form of recreation, tourism activity and everything, these are also part of capitalism. So they are given as a gift. I mean, as a, uh, uh, so they are classified <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. in a way, as you say, uh, through that kind of means. Uh, finally, so he says, urbanity is a form of resistance because I mean, uh, in cities, people never accept it to be part of, they shouldn't. I mean, uh, they have another culture, a certain freedom because cities are spaces of freedom. But on the other hand, indeed, uh, I mean, cities have always been places of consumption. Mm -hmm. They are big consumers in the history. They are parasites, huh? because mm -hmm. uh, especially in, uh, I mean, uh, people, peasants produce food uh, and all uh, these, uh, a certain portion of this food is transferred to the cities mm -hmm. so that they consume. Istanbul is a big consumer of 600,000 inhabitants. Uh, so the culture of a city is the culture of consumption. It has always been so, uh, not only after capitalism, but beforehand. Um, and of course, there are uh, in certain utopias, uh, certain utopias are against uh, cities, against big cities. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, always militated for the importance of, uh, I mean, agricultural activity, villages, and uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is well known for his uh, moral uh, of the rural man, uh, you know. Um, so because cities are also considered to be places of, um, I mean, bad habit, habits and so on. Uh, okay, so, uh, and I think, in the very meaning of urbanity, uh, there is this activity, commercial activity, indeed. Commercial activity in all these Italian towns that you show us. I mean, uh, I mean, there is the marketplace, the city forms around the marketplace. The Agora is a marketplace and there is an overlap of both. Uh, commercial activity and political activity at the same, around the same space. Uh, and then in all these medieval Italian cities, there is, or European medieval cities, there is a marketplace and all around there are, um, you know, shops, shopkeepers and so on, merchants. Indeed, the city uh, is the place of merchants indeed. Uh, the bourgeois <laughs> were, uh, first of all, merchants and they earned their freedom based on that. Uh, so uh, is it possible today? Uh, I, I think urbanity is something in public space, public realm and public space is another thing. Uh, so is it possible to think about uh, a certain urbanity uh, only in plazas, large uh, urban squares without commercial activity. Uh, can we uh, really imagine that? Uh, for example, don't you think that Taksim Square, uh, of course, I mean, it is, it has always been symbolically important, but I know how it was designed. It was designed by the French architect Henri Prost. Uh, and uh, if there were many um, commercial facilities around cafes, uh, shops, and so on, that plaza, that square would live much more than it lives today. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, all around, there are certain institutional buildings and a large park. Uh, so, I mean, 
it is not very easy to design that that space and I think, uh, for example, the uh, Istiklal Avenue has more urbanity uh, than uh, Taksim Square uh, for the daily life, indeed. Uh, but I mean, uh, okay, I, I understand for political activity, large open spaces are very important, public spaces are very important, but what about the daily life of a city? Uh, so this is one thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, cities being uh, marketplaces. Indeed, mm -hmm. cities has, have always been marketplaces. Uh, and I think uh, in their urbanity, there is this. But the problem is that today, these marketplaces were interiorized, as you say. I mean, they are now condemned within a uh, large private ownership. Whereas before there were, I mean, a series of shops. Uh, but what about Kapalı Çarşı mm -hmm. in Istanbul? It is also an interior space. It's not there? exclusive. It is not yeah. exclusive, exclusive, but there are Astra, uh, uh, Arastas. Mm -hmm. I yeah, mean, it's not, it's for, not everyone, for all. Yeah, but it is controlled. I mean, it's closed it's at a certain point. So, I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. we have also in this, uh, I mean, uh, the in Eastern countries, in our country, uh, indeed, Maidan, for example, uh, is, a, is an oriental term. I mean, it, 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 it exists in many languages, including Iranian, I mean, yeah, the Persian, Farsi, uh, Persian uh, Indian, I think, I believe, uh, also in Arabic, in Turkish, and so on, in different forms. What does it mean exactly? Does it mean an urban space in the sense of, uh, in the European sense of the word? I mean, there are very interesting questions like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, okay, don't you think that, uh, for example, at the end, the municipality of Ankara, municipality of Ankara, I mean, uh, it kept the property of this place as public. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a public space. It's not uh, privatized. Yes. <laughs> it's not pri privatized. It will become a public space, a public park. You mean the uh, Batakan Park? Not with this pro project. I mean, mm -hmm. the uh, today's mayor mm -hmm. had this initiative to mm -hmm. Uh, make this uh, place, this Terran Vag, uh, a park. Okay. Uh, do we have today means of constructing a piece of a city without pri private property? I mean, and can uh, a public <laughs> uh, 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 can a public uh, space in the middle of nowhere? public space uh, in the middle uh, of a terrain walk, mm -hmm. is it possible? Yeah. What okay. about the urban texture around? Of course, at the beginning of our studio, we had a certain, I mean, uh, we had certain choices mm -hmm. all together. I mean, when we started directing this, uh, supervising this project, of course they had the opportunity to, go in any direction they wanted. But uh, most of our students, uh, I mean, um, I mean, they opted uh, to for, for rather green spaces and public spaces. Whereas there are very interesting trials. Uh, they have this idea of cooperatives. Huh? Yeah. Cooperatives, okay. So I stop here. <laughs> <laughs> but my question here, is it possible uh -huh to have urbanity without commercial activity. Yeah. Uh, yes, our students have kind of, as you said, opted this kind of approach. And my intentions was- We had is, some. <laughs> is, is just provocate, uh, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, everybody uh, questions, questions and kind of um, appropriates their own idea. Yani e, niye fikrine sahip olduğuna da sorgulayıp sahip çıkabilsin diye de bir provokasyon aslında. 
about uh, medieval cities and even the uh, Hellenic cities, yes, there is always a commerce uh, in the city. Uh, city is based on consumption. Yes, that is true. But uh, I think it can be explained with the economics of scale. Uh, and also the reason why we are paying for our needs mm. is another political problem. Uh, so that cannot justify that commerce is kind of uh, optimized in a way. But uh, again, uh, especially from medieval ages, the issue is the scale of uh, economics of scale. Uh, yes, there were merchants, there were merchants in all the shops and they were kind of uh, bourgeois, uh, and earning their own money with our uh, transactions. Now, in our environment, uh, less than 1% of the uh, retailers are shop owners. They are workers. Mm -hmm. uh, all these chain stores, uh, all sorts of shops belong to certain groups, so commercial groups. There is a problem of monopolization. So, yeah. So that's why, uh, bo so both uh, economics of scale and uh, special spe great. specialization of yani mekan sallaşma, ölçek mekan sallaşması da ona paralel, uh, both are working in the same direction, kind of destroying the uh, almost reasonable distribution of uh, assets in the city. Uh, in that sense, I, I think we are problematizing this. Yes, medieval city was a consumption city too, but considering with the uh, modern city, especially postmodern city, I mean that's uh, that's not comparable. The economy of scale is very important here. Yeah, uh, so that's and how and I answer. And fine grain is very yeah. important. Fine grain. And coming to. Uh, but you can't and your uh, hypothetical question about is it possible without commerce uh, there is a way but it's you know i cannot name it now <laughs> uh, there is a way that there is no commerce anymore uh, then it can be solved but in this situation where you know uh, capitalism kind of rules the whole world uh, th there are ways uh, to kind of let's say scale it down, uh, balance it down, and especially the green issue, the park issue, you, we are saying that it's going to be a public property, but it's it's not a public property. It will be run by, again, certain groups, which are going to be obviously very close to the mayor himself, you know, all these ihale processes and everything. It will be run quite privately. Yes, we will have better access than a shopping mall, to a park, but that um, bundan mı teselli olacağız yani? I <laughs> uh, evet geçebiliyorum orada. Yani that's not the issue. Uh, so again, there is a considerable uh, literature about uh, how this greening operates the other way. I mean, we, we cannot go into the details uh, now, but. It, it's better to ask at least to doubt about things I and mean, that's that's my point I, of course i'm not asking to share uh, everybody to share my views but let's be kind of you know doubtful about things is that really so i mean my intention is just to you know uh, put that seed into the minds of our uh, young colleagues let's say and then they might answer it somehow and they might find themselves right and they can uh, appropriate their ideas and they can be accountable for what they are uh, standing. Yeah. And so uh, in, in that sense, it's we can argue, sense. our students can argue that uh, internalized urbanism can be appropriated and be good to the uh, human uh, exactly. you know, uh, benefit because uh, as Murat Ojo mentioned, the Noli map, you know, the beauty of the Noli map is that it's not only a figure ground map, but a map of private and public spaces. Exactly. 
uh, you know, he, he referred to the Pantheon or all, all the internal spaces which are drawn in detail are public spaces. Of course, we are aware that they are uh, not devoid of uh, uh, power struggles. That, uh, sure, sure, sure. For this yeah. time of the uh, Kilise of the church, uh, but uh, in a, you know, unidentified future, uh, it can be free of all uh, power struggles mm -hmm. uh, and the shopping malls, which we look with, uh, you know, doubt today can be appropriated and can, uh, the city can live with both its outdoor and indoor public spaces uh, without exclusion, without, you know, control and without mm -hmm. power struggles exercised on them. I think that's one of the ideas we get. Is it, there is a hope, huh? I mean, yeah, sure. external, actually. So long as if there is no uh, power structures in that, uh, you know, negative sense, uh, yeah. one is good in winter, the other is good in summer. You can uh, <laughs> simply say. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I think. Uh yours and uh, Jana's uh, comment on the church, church owning uh, the kind of uh, assets is important. But uh, Eamon Kenneth, actually, he was my supervisor in Sheffield. Uh, yeah. So his two books, I think, is uh, explaining this very well. Yes, again, there was kind of uh, commerce and ownership of the feudal rulers. But he, he is claiming that since it was a kind of symbiotic, if the symbiosis group is there, if the, if, uh, since that was a symbiotic relationship, there was kind of ethics of uh, exploitation, the level of exploitation. Let's say. Mutual responsibility. And yes, so. he knows that if he exploits too much, then, uh, you know, he, now it's totally different. People are there to exploit maximum. They can even die, no problem at all. And they do, yeah. actually. Yeah. Especially in the construction uh, sector. I mean, you know the numbers. And the uh, famous architects are claiming, no, they can die. It's not my business, they say. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of exploitation uh, level and uh, irresponsibility is the problem here and that is uh, stemming from i think again the scale uh, economics of scale then it is too much the individuals the communities uh, doesn't uh, have any importance at all that's why although the church was there owning almost the whole city there was kind of a mutual uh, understanding so they were kind of yes they were controlling them from a certain space, uh, he analyzes in that book. Very diplomatic too. I mean, <laughs> they control they control them, but I mean, can you imagine in, in medieval ages? I mean, uh, the level of exploit exploitation occurring in the twenty first century. It's impossible. In the sense of, of exploitation, yeah, yeah, especially the, the, the question, problems. <laughs> question of scale. The question of scale yeah. is important. You yeah. talk about yeah. economy of scale. Uh -huh. uh, large uh, ownerships yeah. that belong to monopolies uh, is problematic yeah. indeed, and that has that reflects on the urban space with large scale shopping malls um, and large scale office blocks, uh, blocks and everything. Uh, and also the Ram Colas's bigness, bigness issue it's, refers to that as well. I think it's quite parallel. It's not everything, critical about. It's not uh, everything has to be big mm -hmm. because uh, they will be owned by a single hand. He's he's preparing the uh, space yeah. underground, <laughs> the space ground for uh, exploitation. That is the future, he says that is the future you should yeah. get used to. Yeah, <laughs> get used to be being exploited that's what he's saying so this is what we are uh, living in the urban environment and that's what we are, we are questioning yeah, yeah. at least i am questioning and, uh, what we can during the jury uh, there has been uh, there was a discussion mm -hmm. uh, about uh, in our jury. yeah in our jury in our pre-jury 
about the ruralness uh, yeah, and uh, rurality mm -hmm. of uh, many projects. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and there were, suburban. I mean, this is very suburban. rural, this is very suburban, this is very, I mean, uh, I mean, we are in the middle of the city, but again, it's part of the city. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this is not a utopia anymore. Uh, I mean, uh, it doesn't produce urbanity and so on. There were such criticism. Yeah. What do you say about it? What do you say? What is Silence. Your <laughs> huh? Silence. Yeah, our friends should make comments, especially those who are probably criticized should make a comment on that. Thing. I mean, because this is about ideas. Yeah. This is where you stand, how you stand. <laughs> I mean, Maybe the... Yeah, I, I think that like a city center, a huge city center being uh, urban is good, but I think it can also like partially be rural. Like, <laughs> like some events and some uh, functions need that kind of a space, I think. So, I mean, it's... What do you mean by partial? <laughs> Hocam, you know, like some uh, spaces, different spaces, different elements could be uh, like utilized for, I, I don't know how to explain it actually. <laughs> but when you say partial, you, you should have something in mind. Is that is that a percentage, for instance, for you? When you say partial, uh, that, that's why I'm uh, asking you to uh, question your own ideas, uh, not to destroy them, but to release them, let's say. Uh, what do I mean by partial? Half of it urban, half of is, is that kind of partiality that you're talking about? Or whatever it is, you should uh, bring it out. You know, uh, then you can, you can uh, defend it, you can argue about it. And that, and you can uh, develop it uh, in form of a project, which can be convincing. Then, question of lifestyle. I think if urbanity is a lifestyle, mm -hmm. is about a certain culture. Uh, it is about reinventing the lifestyles mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah, yeah but that, if we associate it with lifestyle, then it uh, it carries the kind of Mm, let's not danger, but uh, possibility of associating it personally with ourselves. We cannot, uh, you know, uh, know uh, all the lifestyles possible. The culture of the society. Hmm. Th that requires that requires a, a comprehensive analysis. Uh, if we talk about uh, lifestyles, then you uh, you have to rely on a big way analysis. Way of life. Is mm -hmm. a better term. Mm -hmm. yeah. Urbanity. What do we mean by urbanity? Because we, we started with the reinventing urbanity. Yes, we talk about uh, reinventing yeah. urbanity. Reinventing. Uh, uh, re but re invention is not always a you know personal thing. So uh, you have to you have to you know justify your approach. You you, you should have multiple approaches in the studio, of course, but you should you know. Uh, own your own idea and defend it with the, uh, evidences or analysis or whatever. For example, I dividing think. the land into small allotments, small mm -hmm. pieces in the name of hobby gardens, yeah. I mean, was very much criticized. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do we pri privatize the uh, space, the common space? When we do, when we do it, no, in small I think it's not a matter of privatization. At least I would be against for that reason because they are not privatized. They are uh, given for some time for yeah, use for and use. somebody's uh, yeah. possession, or it's the possession of the municipality. Uh, <coughs> but I think the problem <laughs> there. No. Sorry, I interrupted. Sorry, uh, it's a way of you know these petty. Uh, ideals or petty uh, hobbies that the the, the system uh, you know grants you it. Mm -hmm. 
that's why I mean, it has become a cliche in the past years in the hands of some many old evil <laughs> <laughs> minds even. Uh, and especially in our country, it's called huh. hobby card. Huh. Mm -hmm. Why is it called hobby garden? I mean, it uh, in in England it is called allotment gardens. Yeah, exactly. Allotment yeah. gardens for workers. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I believe the criticism uh, about the privatization through uh, lots. Uh, hobby gardens uh, emerged from uh, our students' uh, depiction of that in their uh, projects. If you put them into lots and if you put, that's not the problem, if you put uh, boxes, building boxes to each of them, that means all of them, yeah, they are. Yeah. yeah, if there was a com common kind of uh, facility building, uh, mm -hmm. which is administered for their collective sharing, etc., then uh, that wouldn't raise that kind of criticism and question. That's why you should uh, uh, really understand and fikriniz uh, sahip çıkmanız lazım, arkasını doldurmanız lazım. Yani. Öyle bir şey görüyorsanız, if you are suggesting that kind of collective uh, farming environment, all the items that you put on your project should support that. It should be consistent. Then you put small dots for uh, maintenance box into each of them. Then a jury member can easily say, okay, all of them are individual. You, you have privatized, blah, blah, you know. Consistency uh, is yeah. very important. Yeah. Criticism is very important too here. Sure. I mean, sure, sure, sure. It's important to be criticized and then uh, to redevelop your ideas to, to, uh -huh. to make them more sound. Tabii yani kimsenin morali bozulmasın. Oradakilerden şimdi bu tartışmalarla yani benim de bugün provoke etme sebebim herkes kendi fikrine sahip çıksın diye. Ya bu böyle diyor da ben aslında şöyle düşündüğüm için buna karşıyım dediğinizde her şey yerine oturacak. Projede de onlar görülür hale geleceği ümidiyle provoke ediyoruz. Yani herkes kendi fikrini tabii ki şey yapacak, savunacak. Ama arkası dolsun istiyoruz. Yani buradan öyle bir çıkın ki şey and finalden it is, it is sonra. Problem as well. yeah. uh, at the same time maybe they should also read certain sources also sure. with support the writers. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, really. I mean, for your patience and for this uh, discussion. Yes. So provo provoking. So <laughs> Good for thought. Good for thought. <laughs> <gülüyor> evet, çok sağ olun valla. Şey, e, ara verip kritiklerle mi devam edelim? Evet, evet öyle yaparız. Tamam, ben burada olacağım. Sen görmüyorsun herhalde. Şurada da arkadaşlar var. Selam. Selam. <gülüyor> Selam. <gülüyor> Eyvallah. Ekran oldu. Merhaba. Burayı Merhaba. Beye şöyle bir kamera koyacağız. Toplam 10 kişiyiz galiba. <gülüyor> Olsun. Tatlı da bazen oluyor birileri. Var değil mi? 12. Yukarıdan da seyrediliyorsun. Oo, çok, çok havalı. Evet herkese dinlediği için teşekkür ediyorum. Çok gerçekten. teşekkürler. Yani gerçekten bu tartışmalar önemli. Orada koyduğumuz her terimin aslında arkasında evet. çok tartışmalar var. Teren vak kavramı da aslında evet. bu anlamda işte hani çünkü lost space dediğimizde ya da void dediğimizde orada bir negatiflik var ama teren var. Potansiyel her var. Her türlü olasılığa, olana açık bir açık alan e, olmuş oluyor. Yani potansiyeli olan ve farklı kullanımlar için evet. şey yapılabilecek. Evet. Yani teren var. Yani böyle bir anlamda da bir argument. Bir, bir şekilde argü edilebilirse. Yani ben evet. hala problem statementların olmadığını düşünüyorum sınıfta. Yani çoğunda belki atladığım olabilir ama onu sanki kendi aranızda anlaşıp herkes birbirse getirelim arkadaşlar vardır ya öyle anlaşırız öğrenciler. 
kimse yapmasın, kör ve basmasın diye. Öyle gibi geldi bana çünkü böyle bir liste problemi işte şeyler, sokaklar yapıyoruz, araba Araba farkı, ha, ha, yani şey, değil var. bizim problem sayı. Nokta nokta problem sayı. Bir belki ana evet. problem bir şey. Yani istiyorsanız Sanırım. o listeniz dursun. Biz ona problem statement demeyelim. Biz aynı project statement diyelim. Yani bir dünyaya bakış şeyi evet. soruyoruz aslında biz değil mi? Evet. Yani burası aracılığıyla dünyaya ve işte saptadığınız problemlere evet. bir bakış. Evet. Yani problemlere evet. çözüş değil. Öyle şey değil bir şey olmazdı. Çünkü orada bir rezistans var. O liste geliyor. Tamam o listede analitik olarak önemlidir. O analizlerin sonucu. Ha. Evet. Çok sağ olun. Evet bir ara. Ha, ee, ne bir ara verelim. <gülüyor> Kaç dakika verelim? Sonra, yani ben buradayım zaten de e, buradan kritik almak isteyen arkadaşlar için ben buradayım arkadaşlar. 